one. Fine. Nice to hear your voice. How are you? It's good to see you guys. I, I really love my visits to Turkey. Uh, have you been before? Twice. Really? Two times. Yeah, two times. Both, both to Istanbul, but yeah, I was over to see some of my players that were playing for Fenerbahce and uh, Besiktas. Ah, okay. So you are familiar with the Turkish women basketball, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's been great. It's been great, and I love the rivalries. The rivalries are unlike anything I've ever seen before. Okay. Uh, Went to some Fener Gala games. <laughs> Tried to survive uh, them. <laughs> you, saw, you saw some coins to throw in the, in the court oh, yeah. and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, and then I also was over there visiting a couple of my players that were playing for Cyprus. And so there was a lot of security at that game, too, when they came in town. Um, okay. Uh, it's, your time is very valuable. We are, uh, I think we will speak all in English. So Emre will be the, the question asking. We already fixed it that. And so if we have an extra question, uh, we try to get permission from Emre and ask to you, okay? That sounds great. I'm here to help in any way that I can. So anything you guys want to talk about, uh, feel free. Feel free. Thank you very much, Coach, for your time. And now, uh, Emre, microphone on and uh, we follow you guys. Is it on? Mine? Okay. Welcome, Coach. Um, it's a privilege and honor to have you here, especially for me. It's very... It's very, very special to have you here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, to me, you're not, you're not only, the, only the coach for me. You, you taught me the game, but also, um, also you made me a better, better teacher, a better man, a better father. So um, you, are, you, you, you mean a lot to me. Um, I just want everybody knows that and appreciate for your uh, precious time and accept, accepting my invitation. Um, so I just want to start with, uh, like, there are many um, women's team coach here, but there are also a lot of men's team coach. So um, they might not know you well. Uh, I just wanted to, I just wanted to let you talk about yourself. But I want to start with your, you are a former WNBA player, um, and you, you are a longtime WNBA assistant, and now you're the, you're the one of the few. Uh, assistant coach in NBA um, uh, woman. So um, I'll let you. I'll let you talk and start. Start like how was this journey start and um, what are you doing in in WNBA right now? What you did in NBA? I just let you to talk. Yeah, well, I think this is probably the most boring part of what we'll talk about. So I'll be brief about this. First of all, thank you, Emre, like for just this invitation. As I just mentioned um, I have loved my visits to Turkey and I have so much respect for the type of basketball that you play over there and the level of coaching um, and then I've had the great pleasure of working with Emre for years now and just love his bright mind and his passion and his energy and his also his love for for people and the players to to serve them um, and I'm very aligned with him on that so I'm happy to partner with Emre and you guys anytime. Um, you know, my basketball journey began, um, you know, as a kid, just loved the game, loved playing pickup with guys. That was my thing. You know, I don't know how much you do that in Turkey, and we don't do it nearly as much in the United States as we used to, but going to a playground or just an open gym and picking teams and playing for hours and hours and hours where the winning team stays on, to me, it was the foundation of all that I believe now. And I think there's a lot of value um, that we've lost with, with players not playing as much pickup. Um, one of the things that you learn a lot, especially when you're blonde hair, blue eyes, and you're walking up to a playground where you're probably the only girl and you're probably the only white person, um, you know, you got you to gotta, you gotta prove yourself right away, even in the warm-ups, or you're not even going to get on the court, you know. So you learn to uh, what your strengths are. And you learn to be confident in your strengths and to bring that to the table. Because when you're playing pickup, you get picked because you help the team win. That's it. And if the team loses, you sit for hours. So it's a big deal. The only thing that matters, it's, no, it's not about getting on YouTube like it is nowadays. It's only about winning when you play pickup. 
So if you're out there playing pickup and you're trying to do things that you're not good at, like a lot of players do nowadays, you're going to hear about it, number one, and, or you're not going to get picked the next time you show up at the playground. I think that understanding of your own strengths and accepting that and not trying to be somebody that you're not is missing in a lot of players nowadays. And that's one of the things I think that as a coach, we should try to recreate. Um, and, I, and we can get into how we've done that. We did that in Seattle. Because I think that's a foundational thing that goes beyond X's and O's is putting your players in situations to figure out their strengths, accept them and know them about one another, as well as their weaknesses and embrace it and not be apologetic, you know, or embarrassed about the things that you don't do well, because the point of a team is that you're better together as long as you know your role. And it's better when they figure it out themselves, as opposed to it coming from you because they often feel boxed in um, and controlled as opposed to, it be coming from peer pressure, which you'll hear me talk about a lot. The more we can create situations as a coach where the influence is coming from the peer pressure as opposed to the coach, the more powerful the influence will be on your team. Uh, getting back to my journey, I played in college. The year I graduated from college, I was gonna go to, the, to med school. My whole family is doctors. And the WNBA began the year that I graduated. So I thought, you know, I got to at least try out. The NBA is starting a league for women. I got to at least try out. So I went to this cattle call. It was 450 players and there was only two spots left for one guard and one forward. And, uh, and it was just a meat market. And, and I was blessed to make, make the team after that and played in the inaugural season of the WNBA, which was very, very powerful for me because it, we have not had professional women's basketball in the United States as long as a lot of you countries have. So it was a, uh, an important thing I felt to get that off the ground and um, to give dreams and opportunities to young girls as well as, as young boys to, con to continue their passion if that's what it is. So I played in the inaugural season, got hurt, and that's what got me into coaching because I got hurt young after, for, after my first year. And the love for the game and competition and the WNBA was still very much in my heart. So going to med school was, I was not ready to do. Um, and so I wanted to use my heart for what I was going to do medicine to help people, to help the players of the WNBA have a great sport experience and to grow the WNBA because at that time the coaching was very poor and it was frustrating to the players, especially our women who had been playing overseas in Europe and et cetera, Asia, um, and had been playing professionally. So they were feeling very insulted by some of the level of coaching in the WNBA. So I wanted to help. Um, that's when I started coaching, 1999, uh, with the Washington Mystics. And then in 2000 was my big break. Uh, Ron Rostein got hired by Pat Riley to coach in Miami, to start a women's team in Miami. And Ron had been with the Cleveland Cavaliers when I was playing for the Cleveland WNBA team. And he saw me play and he thought, that kid is going to make a good coach one day. So when he got the women's job, he basically hired me on the spot and not only hired me, but he's my father in coaching. So I'm fortunate that my coaching father um, is a 40 something year NBA veteran coach. And he's very tight with Pat Riley and he's in the family, the coaching tree of Pat Riley, Hubie Brown, uh, Chuck Daly, some of the greats. So to be able to learn from him for the last 20 years, I still talk to him very, very frequently. He watched all of our games when I was a head coach, um, is really like where I got a lot of my, my NBA knowledge and X and O knowledge, which after 20 years in the WNBA, being a head coach, assistant coach, when the opportunity came to coach in the NBA, I was ready because of the foundation that had been laid by Ron Rothstein um, and some, a lot of other NBA coaches along the way. So uh, Rick Carlisle has been a mentor of mine for about 10 years. He's known as one of the best offensive minds to ever coach in the NBA. Um, and he's taught me a lot about offensive concepts, which I value tremendously. Nate McMillan let me into all their coaches meetings in Seattle for three years. Dwayne Casey was the associate head coach. Um, and, and then Dave Yeager was a good friend of mine and working for him in Sacramento, I learned a lot as well. So those are some of the people who've influenced me. Um, three years ago uh, was when Sacramento called and offered me an opportunity to start working in the NBA. And at that time, Becky Hammond was the only other female coaching in the NBA. And a lot of people thought it can't be done anywhere else but San Antonio. San Antonio is like Walt Disney World. Things that work there don't work anywhere else. And so there was still not a lot of people who believed that females could be successful coaching in the NBA. 
Um, and so I'm fortunate that things have gone well and now there's been a lot more opportunities opening up for, for other young women. So that's kind of my coaching journey. Um, I absolutely love it. I love coaching. I love the X and O science of the game. Um, and I also love, love just the people leadership team dynamic, you know, getting the most out of your athletes, um, aspect as well. So that's a little bit of my background. Emre, what direction would you like you to touched. go? Yeah, you touched a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff and uh, a lot of good points. Um, but um, so we're gonna we're gonna come back to that. Um, but now I'm, we're gonna talk about X's and O's. I know. Um, I, I I'm sure people like coaches are here will ask a lot of questions. Um, but I wanna I wanna go into that teaching teaching techniques that you use and did you learn from the, all those great greatness, great coaches, Ron Rosti, Greg Carlisle, and they got affected from other coaches. And I, um, I, I really want everybody to listen about that, about the teaching techniques. Um, as I said, we, we get into X's and O's maybe sometimes, but I want to, I want to start with um, Seattle years. So um, I, uh, I met you in 2015 and uh, you just become a head coach in WNBA. Uh, you had a opportunity. You had the coaching head coaching opportunity before, but you took over that team as a head coach. And um, we met, and we just we j we we were about to starting create a championship culture. And I remember how many meetings we did. Like we trying to we trying to find the like rebuilding. How we gonna rebuild? And you did with 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 us. And um, I remember we met just like a month and, um, and you go through everything. You ask me a lot, you, you, uh, you try to teach me, but you got, you got a lot of things from me too. Um, so I want to talk about this Seattle years that we have two rookie. Um, you know, we, we got first Jewel Lloyd and then Brianna Stewart. And we have, we have one of the greatest point guard, the play the game, Sue Bird. And um, how, What was your thought process before you come to before you take over the uh, before you take over the team? Um, how I know what we did. Like I want to talk. I want you to talk about those meetings and and like how we rebuild the rebuild that team, become a champion after three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You're testing my memory here. The, that was an opportunity. So I'd been with Seattle 11 out of 14 years in between. I was head coach of the Sacramento Monarchs. Um, and the team had won two championships, but had gotten very old. Uh, the year before I took over as head coach, uh, we had a veteran team, a lot of big names, Tina Thompson, you know, Sue Bird, Lauren Jackson, Camille Little, Tanisha Wright. These are champions, but they'd gotten old and we got stale. And it looked like we finished last place in the WNBA. I was the associate head coach. Brian Agler was the head coach. We finished last in the WNBA. So we knew as a franchise it was time for a rebuild, but it is not for the faint-hearted. I know probably some of you have taken over re rebuild situations, and they're, they're, they're very, very challenging, and they're not for anybody who has a weak heart or confidence. I wasn't sure I wanted to do it because I knew it was going to be a huge undertaking and I would take a lot of losses on my record. Um, but I had so much passion for that city and that franchise. Um, and they, they didn't even want to interview anybody else. They wanted me to take over and Sue Bird wanted me to take over. And she, if I had not taken over, she was going to go to another team. And that broke my heart too, because Sue to me needed to finish her career in Seattle. She it's, she's part of Seattle. So I so just felt so what Michael Jordan said, Phil Jackson, I don't want to play for anybody else. So Sue Bird said it for you. She said, I'm not going to stay around for a rebuild unless Jenny's here. Um, it, you know, so she was going to go somewhere else that was a championship contender because um, she was older, you know, and I, and I understood that. So I felt the responsibility to um, take this over, but I knew it was not going to be easy. So um, we put a plan in place. Again, we finished last. We put a plan in place for a five-year rebuild where we would be in championship contend contention within five years, which is unheard of. It's very ambitious. There's a lot. There's several WNBA franchises that have never won a WNBA championship, and usually it takes you you know a decade or more to even get into contention. But we put that as a as a plan, and we put in systems 
um, that I thought would be the quickest way to achieve that goal. And then we were going to need some, some things to go our way. So anyways, we, we put that plan in place. It was a combination of championship culture, an offensive system, which I believe through my experiences was going to be a layered uh, teaching, a multi-year teaching install so that by year three, four, five, it would be unscoutable, but it would be difficult to install. And if I had had pressure to win in year one and year two, I would not have probably installed this offense because it takes time. Uh, but I knew if, if I had time, we would get to a point where it would be an, an offense that could win a championship and be unguardable. And then a defensive system that would fit the personnel that could run that offense. So I was looking for players that could, that could fit together in this offensive system. And then I had to create a defensive system that they could, that they could execute, uh, you know, successfully given the fact that I was going after more offensive players and defensive players, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we put in place these championship systems, culture put in place years before we were going to be talented enough to win a championship with the vision that if we could get this foundation set, once we got the talent, we'd win it. Um, and so that, that was kind of the approach that we took. And, and so I started with my staff, making sure that everybody understood it so that they could teach it and were aligned, which is always very important because you get one coach on your staff that's not in agreement, not in a line, not loyal, and it can compromise the entire endeavor. Um, so we spent a lot of time as a staff talking through things, getting on the same page and going into to war, so to speak, you know, all together and believing in, in what we were going to do because we knew we would lose a lot early on. Um, and we knew we needed to, to get number one picks, which was part of the plan because we knew we'd need, we'd need a franchise young player, which was Brianna Stewart. I know. Um, so I, re I also remember like on those meetings, like we, we were trying to find, find the name for our defense too. And uh, I'll mention it for a while uh, right now. Um, but um, so why it was so important for you to find, like define the everything with the names? Because one of the things I really, I really liked about WNBA and NBA, everything that we work, everything that we talk, there was a name for it. There was nothing up in the air. Everything has a name. Every movement on the court, every cuts on the court, every every pass on the court, um, everything that we talk that was a name on it. And actually, we spend so much time in that terminology. Yeah. And um, one of the things I always thought that I want to ask you: Why it was so important to find you a flow offense, a matrix defense? So I want you to talk about a little bit of matrix too. So go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of science when it comes to the brain and the way that it works, that the power of words and language in making things come into existence. So there's always these subconscious uh, effects of the words that we use. So as coaches, we do need to be intentional and mindful about what we name things because it's going to affect how it works. Um, we call the, the, our defense, the metrics defense, because it was based on percentages. And I had a group of players that were very offensively skilled, uh, not the best individual defenders, but they were very smart. And if something made sense to them, they would execute it and they, they could follow a system. So the metrics I thought fit our personnel because it was based on playing the percentages defensively and really understanding all the analytics that are out there today about what is a high percentage shot, what is a low percentage shot, and then building a defense that forced the lower percentage shots as much as possible. And I knew that my players were smart enough that they would get that and it would give them more confidence defensively to know that they were playing the percentages and that everybody beside them and behind them was on the same page with, with the same high level goals, possession to possession. And then we built our systems from that. So it's high level. And then we went based on the percentages and we schemed our pick and roll defense um, and everything else, our closeouts and everything else that you can think of was all filtered through the, th the theme of playing the percentages. So that's just an example. But like, for example, our pick and roll defense that we were, was our primary base pick and roll defense in the middle of the floor um, was 
what some people call a drop where the post player's back and the guard is gonna go over or under, usually over. But instead of calling it a drop, which a lot of people call, to me that's a passive term. You know, it's like gonna let you come to me. We called it a wall because that just connotates more aggression and you're in control and they're gonna to react to you instead of you reacting to them. So that small change in language, I believe, and I think there's a lot of science that backs it up, affects uh, the mentality of your players when you use that, that terminology. You know, the other thing, Emre, before I, about language that's so important, you know, there's a lot of talk about culture and we all know how important it is, but not everybody knows how to create it. Culture, and you know this from traveling the world, language is a primary component of culture and it brings people together. It unifies people. If you guys did not speak English, we would not be having a unified conversation right now. But thank God you guys are way more educated than me and you speak more than one language and now that allows us to come together and align and that same thing happens in any group setting the the language has to be known by everybody for the sake of communication which ultimately leads to your your culture yeah so um that's i want everybody knows that like um i i think it's really important for us to create our terminology and um I, th that's not just what i learned over there um some of i work some of the great coaches in turkey too and they really emphasizing about the terminology and um so it's it's a it's a universal thing i think um but i i learn more like specified um in united states so um we did a lot of that and thank you for mentioning it um so now uh, let's go let's go back to that um how how we how we how we um how did we teach to the players um all of those terminology in the practice um you know you mentioned it a little bit about like um, um going and playing pickup and like teams are making their teams right like i'm picking this guy i'm picking this guy and we actually implement to our practice um on defensive side i want to talk about offense a little bit more too but um like we did that in defense so can you talk about our practices like picking up a team and create a team and who is become stay outside and um know their strength and weakness and this stuff yeah i'm gonna touch on i'll touch on a few things because i think this was really helpful it's been helpful to every staff that i've been on is learning some of the teaching techniques that we've done for decades in, as coaches and even classroom teachers that aren't most effective and what is the latest science on the way to create learning environments that lead to the deepest learning um, because they're minor things and some of you guys may already be doing a lot of this stuff but it's reinforcement how we teach is just as important or more important than, than what we teach if we're doing a great job as a teacher, ideally by the end of the season, our team doesn't need us anymore. And, you know, when we took over this rebuild, I knew I may not survive the entire length of it because usually whoever takes over the rebuild doesn't finish it. It's just the way pro sports are. And you can look at it all across every sport professionally. Coaches that start the rebuild hardly ever are given the time to finish it. So I wanted a teaching environment where this team could win a championship even if i wasn't there anymore and our coaching staff wasn't there anymore now that takes humility as a coach because you kind of like want to be the one to control everything but i think the best teachers teach in such a way that the players understand it so well and have taken such ownership of everything that's going on that they don't need you anymore by the end of the season or in in year three or four so a couple things, and I'm gonna to try to touch on them briefly. We can go back to anything that's interesting to you guys. We know some of the basics about teaching. I think we all subscribe to the fact that we know that in order to learn, the players have to be outside of their comfort zone. Everything that we should, that we should be doing with them should be far enough outside of their comfort zone to require perfection. For example, if you're working on shooting, if you always work with the range that they're comfortable with, it doesn't require perfect mechanics. But if you get right outside of their comfortable range, it will make them have to use better mechanics or the ball won't get there, it won't be successful going in. The more we can put them in drills, exercises, situations where the feedback is coming more from the drill 
or more from the situation or more from the exercise than it is from our mouths, the better they'll learn it. Another example, you want your player to shoot with more arch. So you're yelling at them, more arch, more arch. Way more effective to put them in a situation and say, all right, now let's see if you can make it nothing but net. By just saying that, nothing but net, it's gonna force them to shoot it with more arch, but they're gonna learn it from an internal standpoint and the, because they have to figure it out because you've given them a condition, but not just a command. They, when, once they do figure it out, they've learned it way deeper. And you can take that and use it in any con context that you want, whether it be a skill that you're teaching or whether it be like a concept that you're teaching your team is the more they figure it out themselves, the better. Another example, if, you know, we do a lot as coaches when we watch film, when we present information of talking to our players and they just passively listen. If I ask you a question first before I tell you the answer, or if I put you in a situation to try to figure it out yourself first before I tell you how to beat it or how to counter it, you're going to learn it way deeper. Here's an example. Um, all right, anybody speak up. Okay, but everybody try to answer this question at least in your head. What is the capital of Australia? Does anybody know? If you don't know, you just guess. Anybody? Sydney. Sydney. Good guess. Anybody else have a guess? Australian Bashkanta Sydney, Dima. Sydney. So why? Right. We got another vote for Sydney. Yes. Does anybody else have a different guess? No. Right now, it's not Sydney. Melbourne. What? Melbourne. 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 Uh, Melbourne. No, no, it's not that. Not that. No shame in guessing. Anybody else have another guess? No. Ilanmar mı diye soruyor. I don't know if I heard Canberra. that. What? Canberra, Canberra. Somebody got it. That's it. Canberra. And so I, the capital of Australia. I, I, I didn't know it. I just Googled it. Oh, that's no, that's no. <laughs> <laughs> it's Canberra. But see, Google is killing our brains. It's killing our brains. And we kill our players' brains in the same way because we tell them answers before they try to solve it themselves. And by me asking you the question, what is the capital of Australia? And whether you get it right or not, just you trying to answer it first and guessing or even thinking about it. When I tell you now the capital of Australia is Canberra, you're probably never going to forget it. If I had just told it to you without asking you to think about it first, you'd forget it by next week or next month or next year. Think about that in terms of how we teach and how we communicate with our players. It takes a little bit longer up front sometimes because you're involving them more, but they will learn way deeper if you ask way more questions or put them in drill situations to try to figure out a solution individually and especially collectively together, which requires collective problem solving. Even if they don't figure it out, if they just try together first, by the time you give them the solution, it will go in way, way deeper and it will make way more sense to them. And you're starting to give them ownership. You're teaching them to be unafraid of making mistakes, which all the best players and teams and coaches, by the way, are unafraid of mistakes. They're unafraid of failure. And you wanna create that in your culture where they're not afraid to, to say things that are wrong, to guess things, to try things. Um, you want that as an environmental thing because that's where growth takes place. If you have a player that won't use their left hand on the left side of the basket, they're never going to be able to use their left hand on the left side of the basket. But if you encourage them making that mistake, they're going to get it. But they have to be encouraged in that way. So that exercise we just did and how it made you feel a little bit shy maybe or not, you don't want to say something that's not right. We want as much as you can incorporate that, you do it. And not just verbally. So you may set up a three-on-three -three drill. You know you're getting ready to play against a team that's going to hard hedge pick and rolls. Or, okay, and so you set up a three-on-three -three drill, and you say, okay, defensively, we're going to hard hedge pick and rolls. And you don't tell them how to counter that offensively. 
and you just see what they do. Okay, you guys got to figure out the counter because if you're a good offensive player and if you're a good offensive team, no matter what the defense does, they're always wrong. No matter what the defense does, they're always wrong. So you want your team to have a confidence that they have a counter to anything they'll possibly face. But instead of, again, just giving them the counters and working on them with repetition, if you introduce it as a problem that they have to solve themselves first, they're going to they're gonna get it a lot more. Another situation, okay, we're going against a team that they're going to mix up going over and under on pick and rolls. So we're going to work on, on that offensively, but you're not going to tell them the techniques offensively of moving the screen down or flipping it and rescreen or whatever it is that you believe in and teach to counter going under, let them try to figure it out first. Whether they're successful or not, it'll go a lot further when you help them. And another thing about pro players and especially smart ass pro players that think they know everything, if you let them try to figure it out first, it's, almost, it's gonna help you as a teacher if they fail and they can't figure it out because by the time you chime in and you, it's now you're helping them because they tried to figure out, couldn't have success. Okay, now you give them a tidbit or you give them a little tip and it helps them and they're ready for it because a lot of these players think they already know everything and how they can do everything anyway. So putting them in a situation to fail so they want your help it is very helpful. I don't so know you mean, uh, you mean like you then, um, I know it, but I want everybody to understand it. So, um, so you create an environment. You create an environment them to figure it out more than more than telling them telling them what to do. Is 100%. that correct? And then once they if they can't figure it out, then that's when your feedback you can give them feedback, and their their the ground so to speak has been softened the ground has been softened and your feedback will go in like a dynamic seed and explode into some fruit. You know, like, you know, this drill, one of my favorite drills defensively, we called it the dog drill, D-O-G, to develop the, the dog inside of them collectively. Because I told you, I, don't, I didn't have great defensive players. I had great offensive players. But I needed to develop a defensive mentality in them as a group. So we would bring guys into practice. They were very good good men's players that were better than our women in a lot of cases. Most of them played overseas. They were bigger, faster, stronger. And we'd get a group of five men. Um, and then I would pick one player on our women's team. And I, I may pick a rookie. I may pick our best defender. I may pick our worst defender. I pick something, somebody different every time we do it. And I'd say, okay, Stewie, Bri Brianna Stewart, I know you're a rookie, okay? But we're going to do the dog drill. Here's the drill. Your team has got to get three stops in a row. However you want to do it, you figure out your own pick and roll schemes. You figure out your own techniques in the post. Whatever your schemes you want to have, it's up to your team. You got to get three stops in a row. The ball cannot even touch the paint or it's not a stop. If the ball even touches the paint, it's not a stop because our defense is based on protecting the paint. So. You guys have to figure out how to do that. You got to figure out who you're guarding, what your matchup is, what is appropriate pressure, what's a smart pick and roll scheme for this combination and that combination, what you're going to do against cuts, what you're going to do in the post. You guys have got to figure it out. Look at your personnel, look at their personnel, and figure it out. Now, Stewie, pick your four teammates. I know you're a rookie. We're not worried about hurting people's feelings right now. We're worried about winning. Pick your four teammates, and you guys will stay on the court as long as it takes. If it takes an hour, we'll be here an hour. If it takes two hours, we'll be here two hours. But you guys have to figure it out. Three stops in a row, ball can't touch the paint. Pick your teammates. So many things come out of this. First of all, they start learning who they trust and who they don't trust. Helps me as a coach when it comes to people complaining to me about playing time. If I have a player that wants to play and thinks they should be playing more and their teammates never pick them, I don't really have to say much. You better get better defensively because your teammates don't even trust you. So if your teammates don't trust you, I'm not going to trust you. It helped me a lot. It wasn't about me not liking this player. Um, then they have to figure it out themselves. So they could call like little mini timeouts. They were short timeouts if they wanted to like, yo, we can't close out long on that dude. We can't go under on that dude. Let's switch this matchup. And they start figuring it out together how to install basically a defensive system uh, 
in these conditions. And it developed a collective confidence and communication as well. We would get in big possessions of games. Emre, you probably remember this. And we'd get in timeouts. And I'd go talk to my coaching staff. And by the time I'd come back to the huddle, I'd hear all of them, dog drill, dog drill. We need one stop, dog drill. And they had a confidence, even though they weren't great defensive players, that collectively they could get a stop when they needed it. So that's just one example of a drill where I'm incorporating a lot of those concepts of them taking ownership, them problem solving, them figuring it out. And if they're really struggling with it, I may have a tip for them at some point, but it's not going to be uh, until they try for an hour or whatever to figure it out. And then I may say, you guys realize the, the main crux of your problem is this and give them a little tip. But I wait a very long time and try to let them figure it out themselves to the point of where they're so frustrated they're about to blow their heads off and they need a little help. And they're looking at me for help now, um, if that makes, makes sense. The next concept I want to skip to real quick um, because I think this one is one that we get wrong a lot as coaches. And there's a, there's a lot of reasons why, but it's, it's life changing. We usually teach in our classrooms and on the court with what's called block training, repetition. We believe that repetition is the way to develop a skill or a team, a team skill. And so we work on something and we rep it. So let's say we're going to work on, um, I mean, it could be anything, closeouts. And we go against uh, players that are good drivers. And we just go one after the next, close out, close out, close out against somebody that's just driving the ball. And as a coach, we're telling them, drive it, drive it, drive it. So they're, go they're, they're working on short closeouts, close out short against a driver. But we do it over and over again, the same thing, repping it. I'm, I could use a million examples. That's block teaching. Okay, here's a better way to explain it. Let's say if you guys know what baseball is, it's a very popular sport here. Hitting a baseball is one of the most difficult skills in sports. If we were coaching how to hit different types of pitches, most coaches, most of us would use block tra training where we'd say, okay, now I'm gonna give you a hundred, I'm gonna give you 30 fastballs in a row. Okay, here we go, 30 fastballs. The player hits 30 fastballs, and by the end of that block of 30 pitches, he gets better. He's like, okay, cool. So now we're going to do 30 curveballs, 30 curveballs. By the end of the 30, the guy's like, oh, I'm, that, that's better. I'm better. That's cool. Great. Now we're going to do 30 knuckleballs. By the end of the 30, the guy's gotten a lot better at the, hitting the knuckleballs. He walks out of practice like that was a great practice. You walk out of practice as a coach, that was a great practice. My dude got better. Another coach trains his athletes, same three pitches, but he uses what's called scrambled teaching or random. And he gives the players 90 pitches, just like the other guy, but all three of those pitches are scrambled. So one time it's a fastball, then the next time it's a curveball, then it's a, another fastball. And it's not block training, it's random, it's scrambled. The player sucks the whole time. He wants to hit himself in the head by the end of the workout, and you are frustrated like that was a waste of time. If you, the, the coaches that train their athletes with the random, their athletes will blow the block training group out of the water every single time in a game situation. Every time. You have to believe in it. You have to understand it, and I believe if you're dealing with professional players you have to explain it to them so that they don't get frustrated when I was going to adopt this this teaching method with our group because I'd done so much research on it I pulled Sue Bird in we we talked so much about it I said Sue we're going to go to this teaching method Sue doesn't like to make mistakes she hates it when she turns the ball over she hates it when we have a shitty practice she hates it when things are ugly she's OCD but I explained to her these teaching concepts it made sense to her and I said we're going to scramble things so that you guys learn reads and you guys are more prepared for the game, whatever's thrown at you, okay? So practice is gonna feel a lot uglier, but it's gonna help us a lot in the game. She bought in, she helped me sell it to the team, and we adopted that method. And we were pretty shortly, you know, the best team in the league. And by the way, I didn't mention this, this team won the WNBA championship in year four of the rebuild, year four. 
which is unheard of in terms of speed of process. Our coaching staff was no longer there. I was in the NBA. And they continued to run all of our offenses without us because of the teaching techniques that we had used that they took ownership of and understood so deeply and was so ingrained in us. If you guys have seen the movie Karate Kid, um, Sue Bird called me the year after I left and they were still running all of our offenses and stuff. And she's like, it's, it's finally just all the way clicked. And it's like you Miyagi'd us. Like, you know, Miyagi was the teacher, like wax on, wax off. He's, she's like, you, you Miyagi'd us. Like, we don't, we just do it in our sleep now. Because it was so, the way that we taught made it so uh, instinctual to them. And these are some examples of some of the techniques. Um, that Jenny, I think, um, I, um, I don't know if anybody, like, I, I just want to stay here and explain a little bit more. Um, about your your like dimension uh, the, the the drill that the teaching technique that you mentioned it's a block block teaching or a random teaching um, as I understand you said you said it's 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 more um, understanding or like more result um, on the random teaching uh, because block teaching when you like i remember we were playing three on three or four on four or five on five it doesn't matter and you never mentioned the players that okay we go we go hedging on the side we go icing on this side we do this and we do that you always say like you know the player tendency so play play um according to player tendency mm -hmm. and so like some like we we just let them let them play, uh, let them decide what they wanted to do in defense. Yeah, and eventually um, we're gonna have a system. But the more they have understanding to figure things out on their own, then when you do tell them what our system or our our game plan is gonna be, they understand why you're doing it and they buy in. Here's one one other concept that has to do with that. Um, if I were to take a classroom. And you guys, I'm giving you concepts because you need to take ownership of it and use it, whatever makes sense to you. But if I take a classroom and we have a week to learn some material, I have two classrooms. And the first classroom, I teach them the material on day one. On day two, I teach it again. Day three, day four, day five, day six, I teach, 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 teach. And then on day seven, we test, okay? The other classroom, I teach the material on day one. On day two, I test them. Day three, test. Day four, test. Day five, test. Day six, test. Day seven, test. The group that was tested all week blows the group out of the water that was taught all week. We need, as coaches, to do way more testing than teaching. If that makes sense. Yeah, so when now you can maybe talk about show and go days for us. Yeah, so we, we split up our two a days um, instead of the traditional way of teaching all throughout your practice, okay, stopping them, giving them feedback throughout practice. We wanted to uh, test this model. So on our two a days, when we were installing our offense and our defense, as well as our culture, which all need to be aligned, by the way. Um, we would use the morning session as our teaching session. We called it show and go. So we showed in the morning, we would install our offense, we would install our defensive concepts, you know, a little bit at a time. We would do some individual work, reinforcing it. We would do video, we give them a chance to ask questions. It was a slow time of, of teaching and, and communicating and answering questions. When we came back in the afternoon, it was our go session. And in the go session, I instructed my coaches as well as myself to shut up. And we put them in drills and situations to be tested for the entire hour and a half or hour, hour and a half of work with no, hardly any, if any stoppages, you know, like for feedback or anything like that. That was their time to figure it out and to take what we had taught and test it. And we were putting them in situations to test, 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 test. A lot of different drill situations, a lot of different scenarios, but test, 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 test. Then they had overnight to think about it. We'd come back the next day. We'd have some film for them to teach off of 
what showed up in the testing. Because when you test without a lot of feedback, they show you what you need to work on more the next day. It helps you be a better coach. And so instead of just the testing being the game and then learning for, as a coach, like what are the areas that you need to improve on or what you didn't teach well or what they didn't understand or what they didn't get, you're doing it all the time in your practice settings without trying to give them too much feedback during that testing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, we would do stuff like in our show and go sessions, when we get to the go sessions, uh, we'd play an end of game situation, two minutes end of game, here's the score. You guys are coaching yourselves. Here's your board, here's your marker. You have one timeout um, and then they have to call a timeout or not. They have to figure out whether they're going to call a timeout. If they do call a timeout and they need a two pointer, or they need a three pointer. They got to figure out what they're going to draw up and that it gets them thinking. And like I said, it softens the ground like the dirt to where now they're like begging you to draw up a play or maybe they've shown you a good idea. Um, but you're, you're allowing them to a take ownership and just get their brain trained to, to really think, the game to the point where, like I said, they're not going to need you as much, but what they do need of you, they really want of you as a coach. And it's not as much of a power struggle. Um, I want this lead to um, offense a little bit, how we, how we did our flow offense in, in Seattle. Um, I, I had a presentation I mentioned to you um, a few weeks ago and I told the coaches that how we, how we teach the flow offense, what the flow offense um, look like. And one of the questions, I really like it, like, um, so how, did, how to teach the players their role? Um, you know, like, there, let's, say, let's say there's a drag screen on the, on the flow offense, and we come down the court, the two screens happen, and who is rolling, who is popping? Yeah. And or another question I faced with, um, like we come down the court, who's like, are we going to set the uh, drag screen or are we going to rim runner and look for the post or we're going to we're going to do set the drag screen and attack to the paint or kick it out and dishes out. Um, I want you to talk about a little bit of this because it's it, it leads to like uh, players know their role, their strength. Um, who they are, what they, what they have, to take the ownership, accountability. Um, can you talk us a little bit about this? Yeah, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot that goes into this. Like I said, your culture, which you should be speaking of, should be reinforced every single day through your systems and how you teach. One of our, our pillars, we had six pillars of our championship culture. These, these are the characteristics of championship teams. So if you guys want to be a championship team, we need this type of culture from day one, even before we have the talent to win a championship. We are going to carry ourselves as a championship team. And one of the, the pillars was humility. And the definition of humility is not like shy, weak. The definition of humility is knowing who you are and who you're not. And this goes for us as coaches too. And being unapologetic about both. Knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses, and not being embarrassed to talk about either. When you coach female players, they're almost more embarrassed to talk about their strengths than they are their weaknesses. It's crazy. When you, talk, when you coach men, they're the opposite. They, they don't have any weaknesses in their minds, and they've got, they're, they're good at everything. You know? So it's opposite. But having a good idea of both, like what you're good at and what you're not, is very important. And a lot of times, the, coach, the, the players are not going to receive that information as well from a coach as they will from one another, especially this generation. This generation, this is a whole nother phone conversation if we want to do it. This generation is unique, and it's different than any other generation that's ever come before them. And there's a lot of evidence as to what that looks like and why, and it's because they've been raised on social media since the day they're born. And it's affected <laughs> a lot of things in in their in how this generation behaves but one of the things about this generation is they don't value older people the way that we might have where we looked up to older people and we wanted mentors and we wanted feedback from coaches and we cared what our coaches thought this generation most of them don't give a shit about older generations but they care deeply about what their peers think 
So if we know that about this generation, we want to use that to our advantage in trying to, to get them to play in their role. So some of these drills that we've been talking about, but there's a million of them where the feedback comes from within the team is going to be way more effective. And that's one of the things I mentioned at the beginning with pickup in pickup. There's no coaches. If you're trying to shoot a bunch of threes when you can't shoot and you're playing pickup and you're going to lose and have to sit three hours, you think the other guys on the court that you're playing with are not going to tell you about it? Like, get your ass in the post or set me a screen, but stop jacking those shots, right? That's what you do when you play pickup. We don't talk like that anymore. So we tried to set up an environment where the players understood when we talked about playing to their strengths, it was for the good of the team. It wasn't any coach trying to box them in or limit them. It was what was best for the team. And they needed to decide that as much or more than I did. So when we put them in situations where they had to win, every drill was like winning or losing. And there was a person on the team taking a bunch of bad shots and they were losing every time, then they need to tell each other about it. First of all, they should be smart enough to stop doing it if they're causing their team to lose. But second of all, they should have the confidence to confront one another as to what their strengths are and not just confront when they're doing something wrong, but reinforce what their strengths are to do more of it right. And that's a good technique for us as coaches too. Like instead of saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Hey, when you do this, you're unstoppable. Hey, when you see this read and you make this cut, nobody's better you know, and reinforcing the positive of what you want them to do as opposed to what you don't want them to do. But a lot of that was set up in our drill work, MRA, in terms of it all being competitive and the peer pressure of them wanting to win every exercise and they wouldn't win or be successful if they weren't doing things they were good at. You know the drill we used to do, the shot clock scrimmage. This is one of my yeah, favorites. Yeah, that's what I was, I, was, I was thinking now. Can you Yeah, can you every, every team wants to play fast. You know, not every team. Most teams want to play fast because, you know, defensively, it's harder to stop teams that play with pace. And it's also hard to stop teams that play more random and less sets. And that's the future of the, the game. The future of the – that's the teams that are winning championships in the NBA and WNBA is players that, that can play off of each other and they know how to play more than they know a bunch of plays. So even if you run a play at the end of the play, if they haven't scored, they need to be able to play out of it and know how to play with one another and play to their strengths in that random action, some type of, of motion random uh, principles that you put in with them. Uh, but the shot clock scrimmage is to reinforce not only playing fast, but also shot selection without you as a coach having to say it. So here's how the drill works briefly. Get two teams. Uh, put three minutes on the clock. They usually can't do any more than three minutes and do it effectively, maybe four. The clock is essentially running. Um, make or miss, it's going back the other way. Foul is, a, is, is just points. So there's no stoppage for a foul. And out of bounds, you don't have to wait for the coach to, to give it to you, take it out of bounds and get it back in. Okay, you put three minutes on the clock and the scoring system and using the scoring systems of your drill and setting up the parameters of what you're going to give them points for and what you're going to take away points for is another way to reinforce certain things or discipline certain things without it coming from your mouth. So this is an example of that. The scoring system is such that whatever the number is on the shot clock, so we all play with 24-second shot clock, I'm assuming. Whatever the number is on the shot clock, when the basket goes in, that's how many points they get. So, for example, I get the outlet, I kick it ahead, we get a corner three, there's 18 seconds on the shot clock, my team gets 18 points. They take it out of the net, they come back this way, the point guard just pulls from the top of the key, air ball. My team gets it, we go down the floor, we kick it ahead, we get a step up, don't have the roll, pull behind, throw it back, don't have it, reverse it, we get a drive kick, bang, three, only 10 seconds on the shot clock, so we only get... 10 points, but we get 10 points. The other team comes down, kick it ahead, just jack a three, a person who's not even a good shooter. Yeah, it's a quick shot, but zero points because it's a bad shot for that team. I get the ball back. I find my hot hand, do a little pitch back to them in transition. Three, bang, 
21 seconds on the shot clock. I could just get 21 more points. The other team sees how far down they are. So they're like, we need a lot of points. So they come down, shoot with 22 seconds on the shot clock, wrong player, wrong spot, contested shot, zero points. Okay, you get the idea. At the end of this, okay, they now have to meet and talk about what they're going to do the, the next time we play it. So maybe we play again in a few minutes or maybe we play again next, next day or next week. But what it's reinforcing is not just playing fast and getting a shot up quickly and getting the ball down the floor quickly, but finding a great shot. Um, and that depends on who your teammates are and what their, their strengths are. And if you want to win the drill and you're, you're not a great shooter and you catch it and, and the ball's getting ready to come to you on the wing and you can make a cut that opens up a great shooter for 20 points, then everybody in, in the whole gym should be reinforcing that cut and not the shot, the cut that led to the shot. So they start understanding the little things that don't show up on the stat sheet that add value to winning that can be reinforced as a strength, a cut, a screen. Um, a read, you know, where it's leading to something that is it, that a, an average basketball mind wouldn't even see, you know, and, and the, the, the people on social media aren't going to see, and it's not going to end up on YouTube or TikTok, you know. So we as coaches creating an environment where they can recognize through our film sessions and through the feedback we give all the little things that add value that are just as valuable as making a basket. Um, that help players feel good about playing to their strengths, even if it's not shooting. If that makes sense. I just covered yeah. a lot. Before, um, I want to ask if there, if anybody has a question. But before, before that, I want to, I want to touch one more point too. Um, that was um, I, one of the things I've learned when we were in Seattle. Um, it was being comfortable with ugly practice, and sometimes I feel like. Um, you know, you already mentioned it. You already said that. Like you, you, um, you, you, you acting like you weren't in the practice. Um, sometimes I was like, "Where's Jenny? Like, wh where, where did Jenny go?" Um, there's one of those uh, show and go days, and um, you just let the players play um, and figure it out themselves. Well, I want to make it clear for everybody: it, it doesn't mean that we're not giving them any tips or any. We're not teaching them anything. We were. We were teaching them. We were telling them. We were, we had a drills that to um, you emphasize that. But when it comes to that, like applying time, they were all themselves, and they were figured out, figuring figuring out themselves. And and I, I kind of was uncomfortable being the practice ugly. And remember when we sometimes like afterwards the practice, we always had a meeting and. You were like, so how was the practice? I was like, what am I gonna do now? What am I gonna say now? It was shit. I mean, it was it was bad. Um, but at the end of the at the end of the season, I felt like we, players are getting understanding each other more. Players are communicating more, um, and it's just come from we let them to figure it out, figure yeah, no it doubt. out. We, but but in that, Emre, you may or may not remember, when it came to the day before a game and I knew we would need confidence going into the game, I would structure practice in such a way where it was going to be much less failure and it was not going to be ugly. It was going to be more of a feel-good day. True. But I was the one controlling that without them knowing. Okay, this is good. We're true. three days out from a game. This is going to be a strategically ugly day of improvement. But when we get to day before, I'm going to be – putting them in situations to be successful. So we go into the game feeling like we're the shit. Yeah. Um, Bratabi, um, is there any question for Jenny for now? Like, um, let's just give a pause a little bit. And if there's any question, I, I see uh, Arkanabi wants to, wants to ask something. So um, let's go, let's go to questions a little bit. Okay. Bratabi, can you hear me? Tamam, Erkan sorar mısın lütfen? Okay, so hi from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm in Nashville right now. <laughs> That's where I was born and raised. Oh yeah, it's a good good city. You'll like it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm working here as a professor. Uh, so I have, first of all, thank you very much for your sharing. 
And I have one question and one comment, okay? Uh, yeah, I'll start with the comment. You mentioned that about testing uh, method. Uh, we use in also in college. So, but the be good things for, I mean, important thing for testing method, you need to make good assessment for your tests. Good, make a good uh, evaluation for your test. I mean, uh, while you're making your test and every player has failed, this is not your daily problem. This is problem of your coach stuff. So you need to do something yourself. So testing is not not, not only testing for the players. Testing exactly. the staff. That's so, a great point. Great point. Yes. Yeah, so I'm coming to my uh, question. I'm always curious about it. And also Emre can answer that question also. Um, what, do you, uh, what is your opinion? Why there are less number of European players in women NBA? if you compare MBA? Is that like skills or talent things or some marketing or transport something? What is your opinion? Why the number of the European players less than uh, the MBA, which is in play in the I've been NBA. out of the WNBA a few years, but Emre, is that true? Because it used to be that WNBA had more, percentage-wise, more uh, foreign players than the NBA. Um, well, I don't know the example number. Uh, number I will check and I will study study that. I promise. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I check. I, I check mean, uh, weeks ago. Before, before, yeah, bef yeah before I say something, I want to study it. But uh, I cannot be. I would say this: um, there, there are, there are more uh, NBA teams, and there are very, very few WNBA teams, like twelve to thir thirty. 30 what, Jenny? 30 teams? Oh, yeah. um, so maybe the percentage of, uh, it, it might be a little bit um, off, but um, I agree with you. Um, and I, I, I really don't know why, um, but there are really good, there are really good um, players from Euro Europe that been leading um, like MVP and leading uh, scoring in WNBA. One of them, Emma Messerman. Um, Belgium power forward is doing an amazing job here. Um, uh, there's a French players um, played a long time, but there are not many. I, I agree. I agree with you, and I really. Well, one thing uh, I do I'm, know. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Emre. Is that one thing that like WNBA has not historically paid as much as Europe? No. WNBA. That might be so one of the reasons. When too. I when I coached some European players before. If it wasn't a good experience for them, like they weren't on a team where it was a good experience, then they'd be like, screw it, I'm going back to Europe. Like they would take it or leave it. Like it, WNBA was something they it seemed to aspire to do, but they also didn't, weren't making so, as much money. So if it wasn't a good experience, then it wasn't always worth it for them. I don't know if that's a factor now. Yeah, I, I, wrote, I wrote there some article about it. It's saying the yeah. same thing like you said. So that's why I ask your uh, opinion. So I think the one reason for um, they don't come here about money and also the other uh, marketing stuff. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other um, yeah. questions? I want to ask one more question. One question. Emre? Yeah, yeah, go, go coach. Um, Jenny, this is... Hi, this, Jenny. Oh, uh, yes, I uh, will Zafir Abi. Myself. Don't worry Zafir about Abi. it. Zafir Abi, Zafir Abi, introduce yourself first. Yes, yes, I said I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, I was head coach in that uh, you were talking about the Cyprus team with Amra. Uh, we were very, uh, we were had, we had very uh, successful two seasons uh, with the Cyprus team, Yakudo University, and we were so happy. But uh, suddenly they closed the team, so uh, that dream is over. Uh, first of all, uh, we are all uh, participants here in Turkey are very happy to hear from you uh, uh, about today, uh, this meeting. Thank you very much for your hospitality. Uh, you are really doing a great job here and very interesting uh, conversation for up to now. Uh, my question is, uh, we did it uh, in also in our team, three stop in a row. You talk about that defense. Uh, when you start that drill, uh, you are not. Uh, are you uh, putting some rules for uh, that, uh, or you leave the players and 
start watching what they are uh, doing uh, in the practice. That's my first question. And my second question is, uh, you did a uh, good uh, pick uh, with Brain Stewart and Jewel Lloyd, of course. Uh, they are really great players and they show them uh, this uh, by in uh, the United States national team also. Uh, one of them is the starting five, the second one, Lloyd is the, maybe the best sixth player. Uh, was that a great plan uh, for you in Seattle or uh, every team in the NBA or WNBA uh, lost a few games in the end of the season and try to get the draft advantage uh, by losing those games? Is it regular? That's my second question. Thank you very much. Okay, so the second question is, do teams in the NBA and WNBA try to lose games on purpose to get a draft pick? Yes. 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 Um, but both leagues have taken measures to try to eliminate that. Um, like in the WNBA now, they go off two-year record. Um, and in the NBA, they're, they're making some changes too. Um, to try to eliminate that because like in the NBA, at the end of the season in the NBA, there's sometimes there are as many as one third of the teams not trying to win games anymore, which is not good for anybody. Um, yeah. So both leagues are, are looking at that and trying to figure out ways to keep parity in the league and help teams that are struggling with higher draft picks, but to discourage the, the losing on purpose. I don't know how much, if you can eliminate all of it, but they're trying to limit that. Um, first question, uh, with the, the dog drill that we did, we really didn't have uh, a lot of rules. We, like I said, we made it even harder than just three stops in a row with the fact that the ball could not even touch the paint. Yeah, that's couldn't even get in the paint. So that really forced them to learn uh, what was appropriate pressure for each one of them. It, taught them how when they were off ball defenders, how to discourage drives by being in the gaps and stunting at the ball and showing uh, congestion, showing a crowd, so to speak, to discourage a drive, especially if it was a mismatch, or maybe they would even preload to the ball if it was a mismatch uh, on the ball. But they had to start learning all these concepts of, um, as a unit, doing something very, very difficult. The reason why we made it no paint is not just because it makes the drill way harder, but there's a lot of analytics, a lot of numbers that show that the field goal percentage of offensive teams when the ball touches the paint at any point during the possession is significantly higher than a, than a possession where the ball does not touch the paint within the possession. And so it's, it was a foundational principle of our defense was no paint touches. And we knew that if we were doing a good job, we, the ball would not be touching the paint and that would allow us to stay out of scrambles, uh, to keep us out of rotations, to enable us to be in mostly short closeout situations as opposed to like long, many, many steps to close out, which are extremely difficult. Um, and to keep our matchups by not having to, to rotate and scramble. And that helped our rebounding. Because our rebounding goal was a defensive rebounding percentage of 80%, of 80 which is a big challenge. And you won't get that goal if you're in scrambles all the time. Um, so this was a drill that was just re reinforcing our foundational principles without, without saying them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Coach. And, and also, I want to thank you. Uh, one more thing about. Oh, you're muted, Coach. This is basketball. Thank you. Sorry, I missed that. You were on mute. Sorry? You were muted. Can you say that one again? Yeah, yes. Uh, I want to thank uh, too much for Emre that uh, you keep him with you uh, in Seattle and improve his basketball. Thank you very much for that also. Oh, you guys, you guys have created a good one in Emre. So it's going to be hard for y'all to get him back because I'm taking him anywhere I can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, coach. Um, Muratavi, is there any other question or I can, I can.
Birkaç tane var aslında. Ahmet Can'dan var. Mesajları okuyabiliyor musun? Ahmet Can. Um, uh, one, one other coach um, asking, I think Rick Carlisle is one of the exceptional coaches in the, in the NBA right now in terms of hardcore coaching. How does it feel to be in, this, in his team, in his staff? I mean, it, it's awesome. He, he's uh, been mentoring me for over a decade. I started studying him because we had Lauren Jackson, who is very similar to Dirk Nowitzki. And uh, just some of the stuff they were doing offensively, I thought would help us in Seattle when we had Lauren and we were winning championships with Lauren Jackson. Um, and so he's taken me under his wing and he is, he and Mark Cuban are two of the smartest people I've ever been around. Um, but the thing I like about Rick is that he's brilliant, he's successful, but he's always learning and he's always uh, picking people's brains. He's never above asking questions to anybody. And so he's always getting better. And that's one of the reasons I think that he's had such the, the long uh, duration. You know, there's hardly any coaches that have that long of a tenure other than Popovich, Eric Spolstra and Rick. But part of the reason is because he's constantly evolving. And the fact that you guys are on this call and you're hungry to keep learning and open to new ideas, it's, that's the trait that, that I think has made Rick Carlisle so great. Um, well, I have one question and then another question I see in the chat, uh, group chat, uh, but one question is from me. So I looked at Abdallah's a little bit this, this year in terms of the numbers. So uh, Dallas is the first in the league point per possession right now. Yep. yep. Um, but it's one of the weird thing is you got the flow concept in transition offense from, from Rick Carlisle, but um, now in transition, you're the 20th team point per position in transition. Um, and also the team is really good pick and roll ball handler, ball, ball handler and a pick and roll uh, roll man and spot up there in the second and the first in the league point per possession. So what, like why, why such a coach that likes to be, play flow offense in transition um, now in the first in the league for point per possession, but 20th in the league uh, in transition? Uh, two words, Luka Doncic. He, he doesn't really like to, to run a lot, you know, and he's got the ball in his hands and he likes to control the game. And I don't think we're going to argue with him too much. I mean, we encourage him to push it and kick it ahead and all that kind of stuff. But as of now, he, he likes to control the game and, and he plays at his pace. And, uh, and so that's, that's the short answer. He's a great player and we, we're only going to, we're not going to try to overcoach him, put it that way. And probably, probably that's why, that's why you're good in uh, pick and roll ball handling and pick and exactly. roll, pick and roll roll man in the first in the league and the second in the league point per position. Yeah, exactly. Um, we, you know, we have, uh, we have a couple exceptional role guys, uh, but we do give our players the option to roll or pop. We play a positionless, we play a very similar system that we played in Seattle. The future of the NBA and WNBA is what they're doing in Seattle and what we're doing in Dallas. It's five outs, five out spacing, um, very few post-ups, and very few long two-point shots. It's drive, rim, three-point, drive and kick, inside out. And the pick and rolls are not only to create shots at the rim, but to, to open up three-point shooters. And, um, But the five out spacing and the positionless basketball where there really isn't assigned positions and every player is, is able to do um, a lot of different things um, and the random element, those are characteristics of our Seattle team that won a championship and also the Mavericks team, which is leading, leading the league in offense right now. No. Yeah, I, um, in my presentation, that's what I wanted, I wanted to show coaches that Um, I'm just moving play, downstairs because my baby's getting away from family. my lap. So I'm still um, with you guys. I just got to get out of the way or I'm going to have a baby crawling in my lap. <laughs> so can I ask other, other question? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure. Keep on, keep it going. Um, there, there, uh, Coach Emre asking, do you use any mentally preparation 
for rookies or new players at preseason? If you use, please talk about it a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. You know, um, all of the stuff that I mentioned about us from day one addressing our, our pillars of our culture, which are our values and our, um, you know, what was important to our team and the way that we operate and the way that we behave and the way that we treat one another. Um, we, the day one that we get together, that is taught to them and not only taught, but reinforced. We can say things as coaches. If we don't reinforce it in our actions, it doesn't go anywhere. So for example, if you say that you're a defensive coach and our system is, our identity is defense and you spend 60 to 70% of your time in practice on offense, or you play your best offensive players and don't hold them accountable for defense, then they're going to call bullshit on you for being a defensive coach and having a defensive identity. So whatever your culture, your principles are, um, you, have to re you have to reinforce it and be very, very consistent um, in, in being that that's the main thing that you're going to discipline and reinforce, if that makes sense. So if the mental part is, is ingrained in everything that we do, it's part of our culture that what our characteristics were for mental toughness. Like one of our pillars in our championship culture was resilience. It's a, it's a trait of every great player and every great team. Resilience meaning mistake response. So you make a mistake and you bounce right back. No matter what you do to me, I'm coming right back at you. I'm coming right back at you. I'm coming right back at you. I'm coming right back at your ass. And you can say that resiliency is, is a part of your culture. Um, but if you have a player that drives in, does what you want, misses the shot, and you're chewing them out, you're not helping that. If, you have, if I have a player and we're talking about resiliency being a part of our culture, and they miss a shot and they hang their head running back down the court and they're beating themselves up and they're not back in the moment, I'm disciplining that. I'm not disciplining them missing the shot. I'm disciplining their, their mistake response because it's mental weakness and it's not resilient. And that's what we're about. And they've been taught from day one, this is who we are and this is what we're about. And we're going to reinforce and discipline these things. And then it becomes embedded in, in all of them, not just coming from you, but from each other. Hey, pick your head up. Come on, next play. Like, it's part of who we are. Make sense? Yep. Um, another, another question. I want to combine two things that um, I want to cover two things. One of them. Um, how was the transition uh, from WNBA and NBA? Um, I want you to give a little bit, a um, little bit, um, I want you to talk about a little bit of that. And, and previously, Mavericks, you work in uh, Sacramento King as, an, as a player development. Um, so I want to I want to uh, pick your brain about how what what is your what is your approach to player development and what did you do in Sacramento in terms of um, preseason preparation? Um, what did you guys do uh, on the post and guard and um, and uh, forwards? What 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 did you guys do? I don't know if we have time to get into all of the player development is a huge thing in the NBA now. It's almost taken a, on a life of its own. Every team has an entire player development staff. So not only are the assistant coaches working with players on player development, uh, most NBA teams, if not all, have a player development staff, and, and some of them are quite large. I mean, we have a shooting coach. We have a sports psychologist. We have like three to five, six uh, player development coaches. And it's a year round thing. And then not, not just that, most of these guys have their own player development guys that aren't even part of the team. Um, so I almost think it's gotten out of control where these guys, some of them would rather work out one-on-one -on -one, uh, than compete. <laughs> you know, they, mm -hmm. they love these individual workouts and their player development guys, especially the ones that aren't associated with NBA teams, just kiss their butt and they're just part of their entourage. And I don't know if they get them, a lot better for what's applicable to the NBA. I think the best player development coaches, whether you are coaching a team or you're just a specialist in that area, have a great sense for 
the player that you're working for, the individual player, and how to make them the best version of themselves and how to help them uh, be best at what's going to get them a role on a team in the NBA or the role in the are going to help them with the role that they have with the specific team that they're on. So you have to have a knowledge of that, I think, to, as your starting point. I, I don't think any workout or any workout plan would be the same for any two players. And a lot of the, the weaker player development coaches just do the same thing with everybody. They do the same thing. They say the same thing to players for shooting. They say they do the same ball handling drills. And, and the good coaches tailor make every workout and every plan for that specific player to make them the best version of themselves in the role that the coach is going to want them to be on their team. You, you guys know that from being coaches, like you don't want somebody coming in and working with your player on something that they're even at best going to become mediocre to average at, and you don't want them doing in the game, you know? So uh, we want players to work on their weaknesses, but we also don't want them to not be reinforcing their strengths not they we don't want them working on their weaknesses that are all that's only going to get so good anyway at the detriment of mastering their strengths that makes sense yep and uh Emre. coach wanted to ask a question i think Omar coach wanted to ask a question um hi coach thanks for being with us i have real quick two questions first first of all i I, I guess you track it, but do you track the number of paint touches during the games? And what's, what's the goal, num number of paint touches for a game? I mean, the pace is different, time is different, but we can check the possession numbers and we can arrange for ourselves. And second question is now, like, in NBA, I guess I really don't know women in NBA, but I guess it's the same there, too. Like, mid-range pull-ups is over. Like, nobody is shooting now in between twos. So, just layups. And catch and shot trees so as a development coach because like defensive mentality is right no pain touch as you said and they look to run the shooters off the line so as a development coach in NBA or women NBA a lot of people like uh, making players uh, practice these pull-ups in, uh, in between jumpers or just there will be no more pull-up jumper shots there's a great question uh, the first question I don't know the answer to. We have like ten analytics people, and I don't, and we don't really talk about it with with our team here. Um, other than we we will say to them at halftime or in a timeout, like, "Yo, we we're not getting any paint touches. We need inside out threes. We need an emphasis on the ball touching the paint, or vice versa on defense. Like the ball's getting into the paint too much, or we've had five stops in a row where the ball hadn't touched the paint." well done you know so we kind of use it as a more general thing i can try to find out the number if you if you would like uh if we even have a standard i'm not sure um you're muted coach yeah sorry sorry i mean it will be great if we can have it so emre can send us a message so yeah. we can also focus on it because as i'm an also an engineer so i love i, I like this math stuff too so yeah. i believe in basketball it's very important too yeah yeah, and your next question is, I can't, I don't think there's a hotter topic in coaching now, and a more widely debated amongst coaches in the NBA, um, is the value of the pull-up jump shot, if there is any anymore. Because the analytics guys, I mean, we have an analytics guy on our staff getting paid millions of dollars. Okay, so these guys, we have analytic staff, sometimes five, 10 guys getting paid a lot of money by our owners. Um, and they're convinced about these numbers and they're talking to our owners and there's a great amount of pressure on us as coaches to adjust to some of the numerical uh, research that's out there. And one of the things that all the analytics guys will tell you is that there is no place for the pull-up jump shot anymore unless it's end of shot clock or end of game. If it's one possession end of game or it's end of shot clock, there's a place for it. But within the context of a game, that shot will get you beat over time, which is a dilemma because as players, players want to take that shot, especially if it's open. It's counterintuitive to players to not take an open shot, especially one they believe they can make and they probably can make. Um, and it's counterintuitive to a lot of coaches, especially coaches who've been coaching a long time to not want to take what the defense gives them. The numbers show that over time, that, that shot will not beat 
the other shots, points for possession. Um, so I think the approach, I think knowing that is important as a coach, that it's not as valuable a shot over time, but then figuring out your way within your personality and leadership style and strength of your team and your personnel, um, how you're going to handle that and whether you're going to address it at all, or whether you're just not going to practice it or whether you're just going to reinforce taking more threes or maybe it's personnel based. Like this is the question that every coaching staff is asking, to be honest with you. And it's one that we all need to be talking about and having these tough conversations and thinking about if we want to keep up with the game, because there's not as much value in that shot over, over time. And so how do you handle that player development? Again, a lot of player development coaches are getting fired if they don't support this mentality of thinking. Um, I think a good approach to it is we're still going to work on it, but know that it's like really for end of game, end of shot clock. So they have it in their toolbox, but they understand the context a little bit and they're not just taking it all game long. You know, yeah, you can take this every now and then, keep the defense honest, especially in the shot clock and end of game, like green light. You know, so we're going to work on it, but we're going to work a little bit more on driving and different footwork around the rim and finishing and three point shooting off the move and, you know, step back threes and, and kind of the future of the, of the game. Thanks coach. Very honest answer. I hope the last sense series will help us for the pull up too. <laughs> yeah. Any question? Any other question? Ee, Özlem'le Ozan'da var. Koçu da çok fazla şey yapmayalım. Son iki soruyu alalım istiyorsan. Sonra koçun da düzenini bozmayalım. Özlem istiyorsan sen sorar mısın? Hello coach. Uh, this is coach Özlem. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the boomer coach in Turkey. And uh, last five years I have been coaching for the first division. And now I'm in Fenerbahçe with the young team. Uh, where I was coaching uh, for the the uh, Super League, uh, we have too many WNBA players and in the beginning of the session you mentioned about how sharing uh, important with the players and how, you, how, you, how it's important to keep the good relationship with the players. Well, I was doing it too because I was an uh, old player and um, as, I, as I was a woman, you know, I thought uh, it's a good idea to, to keep the good relationship with the players. But uh, some of them, you know, some smart asses, I can say, <laughs> they're using it, you know, in a bad way. Well, maybe they have bad intention or maybe they are doing it on purpose. But still, I believe sharing with the players is really good because they are playing on court and, you know, uh, and you're leading them on the sideline. So if you um, play together like this, the success comes like that. But uh, my question is, how do you keep the limit? Like, Where, where you can go with the players about your relationship or how, how you can share them. So this is my hard thing when I was coaching with the big players. That's another great question. And the answer is, there is no exact answer. There is no exact answer. I agree. If, if I try to be like any other coach, I'm going to fail. I can learn things from other people, but we all have to figure out our own leadership style that's true to who we are. Being authentic and knowing who you are is where your confidence and your influence comes from. So it's a lot of it is trial and error, you know, like learning where that boundary uh, needs to be and what's comfortable for you. And then there's sometimes players are just assholes and it doesn't work out, you know, But then there are other times where you have to look in the mirror and you say, like, I, I could have been better with this or I need to reset the boundary here. But, like, that's part of the challenges of leadership is that it's, it's organic and it's not an exact science and it's not just about reading books. It's a constant uh, learning every day of trying to figure out how to be effective. And it is helpful to have good people around you that can also give you feedback. Like, your coaching staff is vital people that you trust more than they know basketball, that you trust them, that they want the best for you. And they'll tell you the truth, um, you know, and help you to continue to grow as a coach, not just have to learn everything by mistakes. Thank you. 
Thank you. And it's all good uh, information. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, I'm sorry. There's no exact science when it comes to dealing with people. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> but still working on it. <laughs> yeah, and, and good job. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's good to see a, a woman on here. I love my guys. Oh, thank you. Good to see a woman. <laughs> I've only got you. a couple minutes and then I have, actually have another meeting. But I'm happy yeah, we, to. Uh, we're, we're, about, we're about to wrap up, but there, there's one question from Coach Ozan. So um, let's just get that. All right. Uh, I, I, thank you very much, first of all. And uh, being the last one, I have to cut it short. So uh, actually, Omar asked about it. I, I really wonder if that, uh, how are you guys dealing with the analytic guys and your basketball X and O's? Because you know, in short term, short term, you know, uh, you keep getting the information from the analytic guys, and and the players have to adapt that. You know, how how big is the challenge is that for you guys? It's a great question. I think it is one of the most difficult things about being an NBA head coach in this day and age is the number of people that are talking to you and you're trying to keep happy. And some of them have never played a day of basketball in their life. And so it is a huge challenge. And again, this is one of the things I think Rick is the best at. He is on the phone constantly. He is managing so much information and he has this great ability to listen to everybody and filter things and stay true to his convictions at the end of the day while respecting the mandates of people above him and around him. But he's a brilliant man. And I don't know how he navigates it all. And I've told him before, like, how do you keep your instincts with all this information and people trying to tell you what to do and pressure from this place and that place? And, you know, but he, you know, it's, it's why they're getting paid the big bucks. You know, it's a hot seat and they're getting paid the big bucks for a reason. And it's more challenging than ever because of the analytics getting involved because the owners understand numbers more than they do basketball. And so the numbers make sense to our owners and sometimes they're realistic and they're, it's information that's helpful to us. And sometimes it's not realistic uh, because they don't always get the human element and the team element uh, because they're numbers guys, but they do bring some interesting things to the table. And I think it's our responsibility to, to listen with an open mind and filter it and try to stay open to, to the future of, of the game and the way it might be going without losing yourself and, and your convictions in the process. Like for example, the five out spacing is proven to be better. You know, you gotta figure it out now, figure it out, figure out how to apply five out spacing. <laughs> you know, um, it's been proven and a lot of people don't know this. I'll give you guys a tip that even a lot of NBA coaches don't know yet, but it was old school thinking and, and that transition defense was more valuable than crashing the offensive glass. And so most teams, you know, like the Spurs for many years, like didn't crash hardly anybody offensively. They just got back and got their defense set. And now the numbers are starting to show and they have the science to prove it that it's worth selling out to crashing a lot more than what we realize. And it doesn't hurt your transition defense. It actually can help keep teams from running on you. And it's a great counter to running teams and it's a great counter to teams that switch defensively. So when you're going against the Houston Rockets and they're switching defensively, you put even more emphasis on crashing the glass because it's another way to pay, make teams pay for switching, for example. So just something to think about, but I wouldn't have known that and our staff wouldn't have known that if it wasn't from our analytics team. And so they do have, have value. Thank you very much. Thank you yeah, very much. For thank you. Yeah. Any other question, coach? I think we have to we have to say thank you to coach we we grab a, a lot of minutes so coach thank you very much for for your time and for your knowledge that you are sh uh, sharing with us Emre thank you to helping us or moderating the the, the webinar the clinic um, and have a great uh, season if we have sooner Hey, thank you guys so much. I love European basketball and I watch it a lot and study what you guys are doing because you guys, the way that you move and share the ball and your continuity of off 
sense and just some of the ideas and the creativity I've been watching for a long, long time and I've stolen a lot of stuff from you guys over there. So much respect to the jobs that y'all do and the minds that you have and the passion for the game. And like I said, your country's absolutely beautiful. Um, I hope to see you guys in person. If there's anything I can ever do to help, I'd, I'd love to do that. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure, and it's an honor to to get to talk with you guys. Okay, Coach, thank you very much. If if you come one more time to Istanbul, we like to invite you a, a dinner, maybe. Uh, you will be our guest on the Bosphorus side, maybe, sometimes. I would love it. I, I would love it. Okay. Anytime. I wanna, thank you. Thank I want to thank from my side, too, Jenny. Um, I know you're a single mother, and you have... You have some some things to do, and thanks for appreciate it for your value time and uh, all the all the all the thoughts that you share with us. Emre, you know anything for you, anything. Thank you. All Thank right. You, thanks, guys. Take God care. bless. Take care. Take care.